leave him with Cross. Uh, <coughs> go ahead, Mr. Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, before I begin my questioning, Your Honor, uh, pursuant to stipulation, the defense would move to admit uh, defense exhibits B2 through G2. Again, this would be by stipulation. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Defendants' exhibits B2 through G2 are received. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Cavalier. Good afternoon. Uh, you may have defined this, but your testimony was a little lengthy, so I just want to make sure that your intent is this. You used the term several times, uh, nonspecific injury. Can you tell the jury what you mean by that? Yes. We see many findings in more than one condition. Petechiae are a good example. Um, they are often described in asphyxial deaths. But really, they're probably not, at least very often at all, related to asphyxia as much as they are the pressure of the blood in the head that results from uh, blood being pooled in the venous system. In other words, the arteries are pumping blood to the head, and the blood can't get out properly, so the little capillaries at the ends of the vascular <coughs> tree um, leak or burst or whatever to cause these little injuries. We also see that when there's right heart failure because the right heart is the part of the heart that pumps blood from the body, from the veins, um, through the heart system. So if the heart can't pump that part, that type of blood, then it gets backed up. So petechiae are nonspecific, but they're also hallmarks of asphyxia. So um, again, as I talked about the egg analogy, um, you may see some of the findings in an asphyxial death but you also may see them somewhere else. And it's the combination of findings in the situation that they're found combined with the history and the other tests that allow us to put together the entire picture to make a diagnosis. And just to maybe simplify this a little bit, uh, Dr. Cavalier, would, would it be essentially correct that a nonspecific injury could be evidence of different mechanisms, and that's why it's not specific. Many different mechanisms could cause a finding that's nonspecific. Okay. And you had indicated, uh, you had talked about uh, your credentials and your work at the uh, State of Iowa Medical Examiner's Office, um, and you're just on call, so while you do have an interest in uh, child pathology, uh, you're just an on-call medical examiner like everybody else. You don't specialize in that area, correct? Correct. Dr. Cavalier, um, I believe you had earlier referenced in your testimony that most uh, strangulations and most documented cases of strangulation are by way of suicide. Is that correct? Most hangings are suicidal. Okay. And, and if I didn't say that, that's what I would have intended. But most hangings would be suicidal based on your experience and also the literature, correct? Yes. Um, would these be what... It, let me strike that. Are you familiar with the term static hanging? No. Okay. Um, if a person is intending to take their life, would you expect them to struggle in the same way that somebody who is accidentally hung and is trying to prevent them from dying? So in one case, you've got somebody who's trying to die, and in another case, the person is trying to live. 
That's hard to say. Um, sometimes we'll see fingernail scratch marks on the neck of a person who obviously committed suicide. And so it would seem that they're trying to remove the ligature. But that is um, described as a reflex action that often occurs and does not reflect a change of intention. Certainly, if someone is in an accidental situation, they would like to get out of it. However, because hanging as an accident is similar to hanging that's suicidal, in that the suspension usually occurs symmetrically or at least pretty rapidly, because loss of conscious occurs in seconds, there really isn't time for a struggle and the struggle that occurs is not, would not be expected to be at the neck. In other words, there can be movement as we see with the seizures, the decorticate posturing, but that doesn't shift the ligature. So although one would expect that if given the opportunity, an accidental situation would trigger an attempt to escape. In a hanging situation, there really isn't usually time because gravity takes over or the situation takes over and, and loss of consciousness just occurs very rapidly. And I believe you indicated in your testimony earlier that loss of consciousness, the literature would tell you, would take anywhere from 3 to 15 seconds, correct? Approximately. Okay. So, again, prior to loss of consciousness in an accidental death situation, are you assuming that there is no struggling and no flailing about? Is, it, is that, and specifically, is that an assumption you made in this case? Well, I think it depends. Um, there was one... Um, report in the ligature of a child about, I think, 12 years old or something, who had sort of fallen um, out of a window somehow and got entrapped. And there were marks on the wall underneath him where his legs had struck the wall adjacent to him. And they interpreted that as he had a struggle, and yet there was insignificant injury of the neck. So um, every case could be different, but typically with a hanging type of death, there's <coughs> not very much injury in the neck. During your testimony, it also seemed important here today um, your sort of tying together uh, the mother's final version of events where the child was in this staring uh, state, correct? Yes. Um, and prior to finalizing your autopsy report, uh, you were aware of Kelsey's statement, Kelsey Thomas's statement in that regard, correct? I don't recall that I was. Okay. You did say that you reviewed all of her interviews, and that's where that information came from. I just don't recall whether I was conscious of that at the time I signed the autopsy out. Okay. Um, you would have participated in sworn depositions with my office back on October 24th of 2019? Yes. Do you recall ever mentioning anything about the stare at that point? Objection, Your Honor. Improper impeachment. Stay. Dr. Cavalier, would you like an opportunity to review your deposition? Perhaps you can show me where that might be located. Objection, Your Honor, still improper impeachment. Okay. 
Dr. Cavalier, do you have any notes or anything that would indicate to you at what point you became aware of this dynamic and when that dynamic became a factor in your determination? I'm not sure that it made a, that it was a factor in my determination as much as it was um, something that I recognize may have been consistent with the mechanism of her death. Okay. And when you testified, you described that as Kelsey's second version of the events, is that correct? Yes. But you, inter but you reviewed all of her interviews as well, correct? Yes. Were you aware that investigators were telling Kelsey Thomas your findings and telling her that her story needed to match your findings? They Objection were. improper impeachment, counsel testifying this characterization. Objection um, overruled, witness can respond. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. During the course of those interviews, there's been, there have been instances in which it was pointed out to Kelsey Thomas, your story doesn't match with the medical evidence. And her confession, if you want to call that, changed over time. Do you recall that? I'm aware that her story changed over time. Okay. And were you aware that investigators were telling her that we need to make this believable, this needs to match the medical findings? Objection, Your Honor, mischaracterization in terms of testimony. Um, objection overruled. Witness can answer. Can you ask me again, please? Sure. Were you aware that investigators Were you aware that investigators were telling Kelsey after hearing her story, that doesn't fit, we need your story to fit, essentially? I'm not sure when I was aware of that. Okay, but was, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's all. Okay, but, but in your testimony earlier, you said you did, inter, or you did review the transcripts of those interviews, correct? At the time I signed the autopsy out, I can't recall if I had actually read the transcripts or heard their summaries. Okay. The, your autopsy conclusion was that uh, <coughs> your, that essentially your findings were consistent with the second version of events from the mother? Yes. So, by virtue of your report ending with it was consistent with the second version, means that all of that information would have been reviewed by you because you were aware of that second version, correct? I was aware of the uh, gist of the second version. I'm not sure that I was aware of every detail of it. Um, and the staring was not a factor in my overall diagnosis. <coughs> and Dr. Cavalier, correct me if I'm wrong, did you not just testify that it was the sequence of events including the shaking and the staring that led you to believe that the findings were consistent with Kelsey's second story? No, but I think that the story is completely consistent with the sequence of events that are described with a, an asphyxial death, such as strangulation or suspension. It was more my autopsy findings, the irregular ligature furrow that was upwardly canted but associated with internal injuries, including the petechiae of the larynx, the vocalis muscle hemorrhage, the asphyxial <coughs> evidence of neuropathology that was more in keeping with the second story than 
the first story, which would have been a sling-like apparatus. The upwardly canted ligature mark um, is a telltale sign of suspension, correct? Yes. And suspension is not common in strangulation, correct? That's true. Again, Dr. Cavalier, I have your autopsy report. We've taken depositions. Do you recall, in the context of this case, talking about finger impressions before? Objection, Your Honor. Matter of question, proper impeachment, reference to deposition. Sustained. In, in this case, as I have discussed this with you, Dr. Cavalier, or with my full counsel, do you recall Objection, talking? proper manner of question. Proper impeachment. Sustained. Remind me, doctor, of your testimony regarding finger impressions today. What, what is it that you said? Well, I don't recall my exact words, but I said that there were some marks on um, Chloe's neck that were unexplained by the fact that there was a ligature there, but that could represent fingers, and that would be consistent with her putting her fingers on her neck. And by her, who, do, who are you referring to? Well, probably Chloe. Okay. But I can't say whose fingers they were. Okay. And I think as, as you were uh, being asked about orientation, you sort of reached up like this, is that correct? Yes. And the fingers, as you demonstrated to the jury, would be of the proper orientation of the things that you saw on, in that photograph, correct? Yes. And would those be the same as discussed in your uh, autopsy report as the sites of power that you took measurements of? I did mention them in the autopsy report. Okay, but what, what I'm asking specifically, do you recall taking the specific measurements of how big those sites of power were? <coughs> I'm just wondering if I'm in the right part of your autopsy report. And this would be at the top of page four. Um, they're actually described in the middle of the paragraph that commences on, that's at the top of page four, not at the top of the paragraph. Okay. And the, uh, by areas of power, that's uh, the same as what you described in the photographs is the, the oval shaped areas that you pointed out to the jury? I don't believe that we're talking about the same ones that are on that okay. part of the report. That At the top of page four, I, uh, the second full sentence begins throughout the furrow are gray tan areas of pressure type clearing that are oval to slightly reniform in configuration. On the right, these areas number approximately seven etc. Those were the uh, areas within the furrow that I had described as being perhaps related to wrinkles or periodicity. Okay. And uh, it's later that I mentioned the other um, areas. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. You were also asked uh, about 
child hanging deaths, and uh, again, I may be repeating uh, myself, but child hanging deaths are, are very rare, correct? Yes. And well, I, I shouldn't say very rare. They're rare, but I had one in the last couple months. Um, we do see them. They're not so rare as to only see them in textbooks, but they're not common. Okay. And the two examples that you brought up specifically involved a, uh, I believe you said a 12 or a 13 year old suicide. Is that correct? Yes. And in that case, that was a belt ligature, and it was a suicide, so that person was intending to die, correct? Yes. And then the other example you used was uh, the toddler who uh, fell over the side of the pack and play, correct? Who bent over, yes. Okay. And at, uh, when that toddler was found, I believe you testified that he was standing in the corner of the pack and play dead, still sort of... Uh, <coughs> Well, standing in, in, in that corner, correct? Right? Yes. So factually, these examples that you used would be different than this case because we know Chloe was suspended and we strongly believe this was not, we have no reason to believe that it was a suicide, correct? Right? Could you ask me that in a different way, please? Sure. The examples that you used are distinguishable from Chloe's death because Chloe's death, we know there was suspension. And in Chloe's death, we had no reason to believe it was suicide. I think every case is different and uh, needs to be evaluated on its own merits based on the history, the scene findings, and the physical findings. Just one moment, Your Honor. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. Just briefly, Dr. Cadavir noted that an upward, uh, upward recanted furrow is in line with a hanging suspension <clears throat> style death. Yes. Um, given that you had that finding in this case, why do you still take issue with the claim of Chloe hanging in the closet? Well, I'm concerned that there was a prominent and somewhat irregular ligature furrow with hemorrhage of the soft tissues underneath it as well as in the back of the neck. With her, if someone is suspended by a cloth a ligature with a broad surface area, I would not expect the furrow to be as distinct, but more importantly, I would not expect to be seeing hemorrhage at all layers of the strap muscles on both sides of the neck, as well as adjacent to the uh, cornua of the laryngeal cartilage, as well as around the carotid arteries as well as within the vocalis muscle and the findings are consistent with the story of an active process with a component of suspension and a struggle. When you say consistent with an active process, with the components of suspension, given that we're talking about, I appreciate that you're using a lot of medical terms and uh, given your profession to some extent, these terms are probably like everyday words to you. Uh, <laughs> What do you mean in regards to Chloe uh, and a, I may have missed the words now, uh, active process with a component of suspension? Well, in order for there to be hemorrhage in the neck, 
there would be expected to be trauma associated with some kind of movement or pressure that was a differential causing the tissue to be injured. In addition, there was a component of suspension because the ligature furrow was upwardly canted. With a typical accidental or suicidal hanging, usually the hemorrhage in the neck is not as pronounced, especially in a child, if present at all. And the additional components of hemorrhage around the carotid arteries, the vocalis muscle, are additional concerns that point to a struggle. The hemorrhage in the back of the neck would not be expected with the kind of suspension that was described initially. And the ligature furrow is narrow and irregular compared to what would be expected with a broad surface area and an accidental suspension. It was described that Chloe was freely suspended with her feet not on the ground, which would mean that gravity would be expected to take over rapidly and loss of conscious rap consciousness rapidly. Are there concerns related to a struggle from your autopsy? Um, and, and once again, I, I appreciate uh, trying to couch it as much in your medical terms, but um, I guess specifics, did you see what, what would align with a struggle specifically, other than the neck that you've gone through uh, quite thoroughly, or were there any other indications of a struggle on Chloe? Well, there were injuries. And again, if, if you touch your neck, you're not going to injure the muscles of your neck. You're not going to get injury at all levels. You're not going to get injury around the carotid arteries. You're not going to get vocalis muscle um, injury. And I have not, I don't know of any reason that in a simple suspension those findings would be uh, present given the history. If I had heard that the ligature was caught in a wheel and there was some kind of movement or traction, then that would make some sense. But what I heard was more of a suspension process without reason to believe that there was a struggle in the initial story. I'm going to concerns of a struggle. What did you make of uh, bruising that was seen in, I forget which state it exhibited, but on the head of Chloe Chandler? I don't know. Um, when we see injuries, certainly in children, they can occur. Kids get bumps and bruises all the time. But there are certain places of the body that are more protected the soft parts of the cheek, places that don't have a bony prominence like the upper cheekbone, the buttocks, the back of the knees, and the top of the head. Certainly the top of the head can get injured. You can bump yourself on a cabinet. You can run your head into something. But it's a protected area. Why they're there, I don't know. Further, Your Honors. Recross. Just briefly, Your Honor. Dr. Cavalier, uh, your ultimate opinion was based on a combination of the autopsy findings with the ultimate description of the second possibility or the second description of what had happened, and that's what makes sense to you. Is that your opinion? My opinion was based on the autopsy findings that were consistent with the second story as given.
No further questions, Your Honor. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, one, one additional question, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Kevlier, uh, during the course of any of this, did you have, ever have an opportunity to examine the pajama pants? Only in photographs. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Nothing from your honor. You may sit down. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. You may also be excused and leave the courtroom if you choose to do so. Thank you.